the school for chiropractic. Looking good as hell today, just sent my five test. Why'd you come from me by the man? You better they come in me by the two. I don't even find the train. I don't know that. I just see the one town. I can't be no bill of face. I took up now. Y'all over here being shy, like y'all don't know about Ski Yee. Like y'all don't know about this, this, this tune right here. We saw y'all last night on the rooftop. So y'all could be free, y'all could be loose, y'all could have some fun, enjoy yourselves. This is text giving, we, this is not a buttoned up conference. Be free, enjoy yourselves, do your little Ski Yee.
Strike, bitch. Yeah, the way you move it, yeah. you got me yeah. in a trance. Yeah. DJ, yeah. tell me, yeah. yeah. Ladies, this yeah. your jam. Yeah. I'm a super yeah. scout. Yeah. You don't want to pay. And I'm a throw this money. Yeah. Why you do it with yeah. no hands? for our last workshop on the main stage. Speaking on from idea to IPO, please give a resounding welcome to Text Giving Zone, Nafisa Rauji! has been announced. My name is Nafisa Rauji, and I'm here to speak with you about Idea to IPO. I want to first and foremost thank you guys for being patient, sticking with us. I promise this is going to be worth your time, and I'm really excited to talk to you all because at some point, I'm sure someone in here has had a business idea or been on a business journey, or perhaps you're on one now. So before we begin, I want to introduce myself. If you are in the Discord, which I'm hoping every single one of you is, you might recognize me by my Discord, Avi. My name is Nafisa Rauji. I am one of the four co-founders of TextGiving, a current board member. But in my daytime, I'm a principal product manager at RDM. I am both a Wharton and Temple alum, so shout out to anybody from Philly, lives in Philly, or has lived in Philly in here, Philly made. But first and foremost, my thing about myself is I love bringing out the best in people as they build the best software for their customers. Now, as I mentioned, I am a principal product manager at RDM. I don't expect you to know what RDM is, but I'm hoping after the session you can at least tell one other person. RDM is a software consulting services company that not only helps people with the culture of craft and the culture of building products, but also how to build sustaining, enduring, and successful teams to usher those products even after our time has stepped away. We have helped enterprises, startups, public organizations, and private equity managing firms explore how they can push their own potential with the software they provide for their customers. If you are ever interested in RDM, if you are courageous enough to push yourselves in changing how you build software, please feel free to talk to me after in the Q&A session. Some of our clients include Red Bull, Disney, Abbott, Grailed, I could go on forever. Our website is thisisrdm.com, much more interesting stuff there. But just an idea of some of the partners that we've worked with who have honestly been in your shoes at some point. At one point, Disney, at one point, Lionsgate was an idea for someone that has turned into a brand name that we all know. So today, we're going to talk about the three things that you should avoid in your founding journey so you can be the next Disney, the best Abbott, the next Grilled, but by you and by and for our people. So first and foremost, one of the first mistakes that a lot of founders make in their formative journeys is worrying too much about funding too early on in your journey. Now, we know Silicon Valley Bank is in the building and they are here to help the right folks build the right products. 
but quite often one of the largest mistakes that someone can make is worrying more about their funding before they actually hit the ground running with their product. And we can discuss some of the reasons why that's not the greatest idea. Now you'll notice that I have faces that may look familiar or may not look familiar, but members of the diaspora who have avoided these mistakes and found profounding success. We'll be going into some of the reasons why these mistakes should be avoided, and then some case studies about people who figured it out the right way, and what it meant for them, and what it could mean for you. So first and foremost, it is completely natural to worry about funding. It is, everything is expensive, and it's getting more expensive. But if you focus too much on funding in your early journey, you've missed some key opportunities. One of those things is actually proving out the hypothesis of what you're trying to prove, solve, or sell to your customer. By focusing on funding, you are taking away crucial time when you're already stretched thin to validate that this is actually an idea outside of your mind, outside of your personal passions that someone's actually going to want to pay for. That is a crucial and foundational step before worrying about selling yourself to the point of potentially diluting your own equity share. And that goes into another point of don't become an employee founder too early. A lot of us explore our entrepreneurial journey or want to pursue our entrepreneurial journey because we want to be captains of our own ship, because we have a vision and we want to bring it to life. When you approach funding incredibly early, you risk giving up or sacrificing an extreme amount of your equity to get that funding early on before you've proven your hypothesis in market. Because of that, that can lead to future conflicts of interest, as well as essentially partnering with someone who might not see your vision or might not understand your larger why. Now that's completely understandable and that's gonna happen as a team grows, but if you're able to really attract the right found funding by proving yourself in market first and getting an MVP product to market right away, you can then have more fruitful conversations when you do go to founders who believe in your mission, in your hypothesis, and understand your larger why. Lastly, when you get a lot of funding early or you focus too much on early funding, uh, there can be pressure for premature scaling. Whenever someone invests in you, it's because they see your value, which is incredible, but for an investor, the value that they see is not only just impact, but also a return on their investment. Because of this, it can change your organization, your startup's focus to maximizing that return for someone else early on before you're able to solidify the product that you really want to sell and learn more about your customer. So this is one of my favorite founder stories of all time. Tope Awotona is the founder of Calendly. A lot of folks use Calendly today to organize their ever busy schedule, um, but his story is incredibly unique and a story about how why if you don't get funding right away, if some, there are a lot of rejections right away, don't take it always as a sign that you're not doing the right thing. Sometimes it's about when and not if yes or no. So Tope Awotone was born in Nigeria um, to a very enterprising family. He unfortunately witnessed his father's murder at the age of 12. Um, his father's legacy had always stuck with him because he was an entrepreneur himself. So when he went to the United States, he brought that hustle with him from Nigeria to the United States and decided in 2013 to drain his bank accounts, drain his 401k, not that I'm recommending that at all, just showing the dedication here, stretched his money and bootstrapped to create what we know as Calendly today. Now when Tope talks about his story, it's quite often that you will hear about the numerous rejections that he heard early on. It's quite easy to be swayed by the fact that someone doesn't see your potential quite yet. But because he was able to bootstrap and really learn from the users of his product and be able to maintain agility because he was the master of his own ship. He was able to build Calendly into what it is today, a $3 billion enterprise that he only recently in 2021 received a $350 million investment. And Tope Awotone still owns majority shares in his venture today, making him one of the wealthiest immigrants in the United States. Now, his story is unique, but I say that to say that just because you hear a no early on doesn't mean that you, could, that you can't also become one of the few black-owned unicorns that shapes our lives, our outlooks, and our Google calendars today. Secondly, if you forget the customer, the customer will forget you. A lot of us start our entrepreneurial journey because we found a problem that we are passionate about solving, and that is fantastic. That is often the glue, the fire that gets you through those late nights, the first no's, trying to figure out your technical hurdles. But there is an important note here that you have to maintain user-centered even when you believe you are your first user. If you forget to have 
validated, unbiased feedback from the people that you want to sell your product to, it is quite possible that you could be, build a product that doesn't necessarily sell to a scale that supports your journey and what you want to accomplish in the world. So this here is another amazing story. Um, a lot of men in here might recognize this person. This is Tristan Walker who created Bevel. And we will get into how he, even though he found a personal problem he wanted to solve, maintained the power of customer research and customer community to build what is the premium luxury grooming product for people of color today. So the, first mis the second mistake with forgetting your customer. It's quite common to focus on selling to your customer in the beginning but it's just as important to learn from your customer as you're building your venture. Customer satisfaction keeps lifetime value. It is quite daunting, as I'm sure a lot of us know, and also exhausting to always be chasing the next new customer. But your true scale, your true profitability is going to come from having a strong, loyal customer base who repeats their interactions with you, whichever dynamic that is, whether that's a subscription, the purchase of a product, and also becomes the advocate for your product. This is something I mentioned in the fact that the network effect is real. The network effect is one of the strongest flywheels, brand assets you can build when you are a resource strap founder. And when I say network effect, that means the way your users experience your product, the way your relationship is with your customers, is that they, are, they love your product and they believe that you care about them and their problems so much, they become natural advocates for you. No hashtag AD needed on an Instagram post, no, hey bro, are you sure you just can't post this for me once? I'd love if you could support me. But you have people talking about your product, speaking for you when you don't even know about it. And that means you are now amplifying resource-rich marketing opportunities where your customer acquisition costs naturally become lower and your growth feels a lot more intuitive and a lot more exponential. There's also the power of the pivot. Like I mentioned, a lot of us start our entrepreneurial journeys because we are passionate about the problem we're trying to solve. But as a founder, one of the biggest advice that you could ever get is do not get in your own way. Yes, you could find a problem. Yes, you could find a way to solve it. But for that stickiness and real world market and viability, it's just as important to be able to listen to the people that you want to sell to, market to, engage with through your product, and learn about their needs. They may have a perspective, an opportunity, or a desire, a demand, a priority that maybe you didn't directly experience, but you realize your product could serve. By keeping your customer in mind and keeping that strong customer relationship, it allows you to navigate those changes gracefully and quickly as needed so you can really find your product market fit and get your foothold in the market that you're trying to build in. Another thing too, especially for our tech-based founders, having a strong customer relationship is one of the easiest ways to stand out in the pack in an increasingly saturated digital market. Quite often it is not the innovation that you're building, but if it resonates with the people that you would like to use your technology. If we remember, a lot of us use Twitter, a lot of us use Instagram, but those are not the first social networks, right? I don't know if any of you were Black Planet users, if you ever learned how to HTML code through MySpace. A lot of those things are prominent in our journey, but if you think about it, the most popular player in the market quite often is not the first person to enter. This is both inspiring in terms of you have just as much of an opportunity to get a foothold in whatever you're trying to do, but also it is critical to remember that no matter how dynamic your tech is, how much you're investing in marketing, it is your connection with the customers that will lead to long-term viability, growth, and market share. Now, as I mentioned, this is Tristan Walker. He is not a techie, but I love a good founder story regardless. Bevel is his baby, which is a premium luxury grooming product for people of color who tend to have unique problems than maybe the prototypical uh, sort of user consumer that Gillette is targeting. So. Tristan was born in South Jamaica, raised by a single mother who worked multiple jobs. He moved to the United States as well. Breaks my heart, he abandoned tech to go start his venture, but it worked out really well for him. He was actually a product manager at Foursquare at one point before pivoting to account management. But then again, in 2013, he realized that there was a gap in his medicine cabinet, in his bathroom, and that is a key razor that actually provided him the sort of service, the sort of benefits that he needed in terms of sensitive skin, ingrown hairs, perhaps drier skin, things that Gillette and other premium razor companies just weren't looking at because they missed out on the outlier. Quite often people of color are seen as the outlier when we really, we shape the culture. And now Bevel is a huge brand name today. So Bevel specifically addressed specific issues for POC, like I mentioned, 
But one thing that was really cool about what he did, which is kind of unexpected for a grooming company, is he built an online community education. The main thing he was selling were his razors, his shaving products, but a differentiator for him was creating an online community that gave resources and education. I remember that there was like a resource for teaching your kid how to shave for the first time, for walking through skincare and ingrown hairs for men who, who might not want to rock the beard every day. But that was also an amazing resource because it retained customers in his ecosystem and also the discussion board was primary customer research that he did not have to pay a third party for because they were going to his platform to tell him his, their needs, what they liked about their product, what they didn't like. And when he wanted to introduce a new product or engage with the customers in a new way, they were already right there. Bevel became a roaring success and also became a flagship brand with Procter & Gamble acquiring Bevel for they don't want to tell the real number publicly, but somewhere between 20 million and 40 million dollars in 2018. He was able to change the face, for lack of a pun, of male grooming in five years alone. And part of that, if not a substantial part of that, is because of his relationship with his consumers. Now lastly, the mistake of don't go chasing waterfall. Now this is a more tech focused recommendation, but it applies to physical products as well. And we will get into what I mean by that besides the TLC reference. This is another incredible entrepreneur today who is in the Google ecosystem and an amazing resource for entrepreneurs um, in, at Google currently, Jewel Burke Solomon, who formerly founded PartPick. Now, when I say don't go chasing for waterfalls, as an impassioned founder, we get that you are passionate. Once again, that is one of your superpowers, and that is what breaks you out from the pack. But it is key to stay agile in your own perspective and how you build your products and what your products could be. Some people have a very large idea. Quite often founders will come to me and say, Nafisa, I want to build a SaaS product that uses AI to drive accounting insights for only the big four companies in China. And I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. But what are you going to do in the next three months to get something to market so that users can actually give you feedback and you can see if you're heading in the right direction? There are a couple disadvantages to waiting until you have your fully fleshed, wonderful dream that you've been thinking about ready to go in a production environment. One of those things is delayed time to market is the death of a company. Like I mentioned, you probably are not the first person to get the idea that you have, and the market is changing quite often. So choosing to delay your launch until every single thing is fully fleshed out, your entire dream requirements list is produced, can mean delaying feedback and what is going well and what isn't going well in your idea, as well as missing satisfying your customers' needs. And in the meantime, there might be another product that they're currently falling in love with. Now, by all means, we are not recommending that you release a buggy, crappy product, but that iterative thin slice MVP or minimal viable product that we call it in industry is inherent to making sure that you can get an end-to-end -end solution that you know drives value. It's the foundation, the starting piece of your vision, but it's your way to get your foot literally in the door with your customers and in the market. Secondly, there is quite honestly higher riskier development costs. I'm sure if anyone is a founder or thinking of being a founder, you are aware of every single fiber bill that comes in, every single invoice, every single time a partner tells you, actually, it's gonna cost about 2K more than what I originally thought, but that's cool, right? Part of doing waterfall is that if you wait too long, you're signing yourself up to a very expensive bill that you might have to redo later. It is both more logical, more secure, and quite frankly, more practical to create those thin iterative slices of development from your grander vision so that you can know that you're making better bets with the financial resources that you have. Lastly, like I mentioned, building on shifting sands, the market changes quite frequently. It's crazy to think ChatGPT was only launched a little over a year ago, and it's quite frankly a part of most of our lives. And if it's not part of your life, we could talk about later why it should be. Two years ago, no one would have thought of ChatGPT, right? And now it's here already creating a ripple for other companies and how they're thinking about generative AI. If you have an idea and you wait three years, four years, five years to get something to market, the world that it was when you created your idea will have completely changed. Don't miss your moment. Don't get in your own way. Choose agile, iterative approaches, whether you're building software, hardware, or consumer products, so that you can be part of the change, part of the development, instead of reacting to what's going on. Awesome. So, like I mentioned, Jewel Burke Solomon, part pick. I don't expect you to know this one either in terms of the startup, but it's quite a cool story and it has navigated to 
an, an interesting opportunity for Amazon. And, and honestly, if you are looking for your next big idea, car parts, car usage is one of the largest underserved global opportunities right now. So Jewel finds the diamond in the rough. Jewel was born in Tennessee, if I remember correctly, to multi-generational entrepreneurial family. She grew up watching her mother be an insurance agent before she went to study at Howard University. We're in DC, I'm sure there are some bisons in here, perhaps some of you know her. In 2013, she was inspired at her customer service role to develop a technology that would help industrial manufacturing firms identify needed parts. Quite often people were calling into the company that she worked at saying, my tractor, my machine, it's broken. I don't know what I really need, but I think it's like a circle thing with some gauges. Of course, there were ways to solve that issue at her current company, but Jewel found that there might be an opportunity to solve it more efficiently and with a wider impact through technology. With that, she built PartPick in 2013, and she found that she had to quickly iterate on that business model. Now, as you can imagine, this is something that she experienced from her direct professional job, right? So it's very obvious to be like, well, maybe it's not hitting well just because the go-to-market strategy isn't working. Maybe I need to change whether it's on mobile or whether it's on web. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the idea, but it's something else. The fact that Jules was able to not let herself get in her own way and focus more on auto parts for users, for everyday car owners, it helped her grow part pick to be attractive enough to actually be acquired by Amazon when they were looking to launch their own similar product called Part Finder, which you might have interacted with in your time if you are a car owner. Now Jewel is a advisor to entrepreneurs in the Google ecosystem, but I think it's a very interesting case in knowing that just because you started with one use case, one problem that you wanted to solve, doesn't mean that has to be the end of the story. Success is just as much in getting it right as it is in being able to adapt to the changes as you discover, as you learn, as you maybe surmise that there is a different path, a different problem that you can solve. So those are the three largest mistakes or largest missteps that I would strongly recommend you avoid or at least be conscious of. That being said, this is not definitive. Every founder and every startup has their own unique story. It's up to you to journey, to form your own path, but I think that these are some opportunities that you can look at to make sure that you know that it's not just the first no, it's not just the first problem, it's in your ability to be courageous, to adapt to changes, and to always give another chance. So lastly, as Thomas Edison, one of the most famous entrepreneurs and inventors, innovators of all time said, the value of the idea lies in the using of it. If you take anything away today, I would ask that you look at your idea, the thing that you've been secretly thinking about doing, but you don't want to look silly, you don't want to waste a lot of money, you don't want to stretch yourself and make yourself uncomfortable. Look at that idea because there's an opportunity in there. And I think every single one of you has an idea to go from idea to IPO. So, ooh, <clears throat> so that's it for me. Um, I would also ask if anyone is interested, RDM also produces a podcast interviewing enterprise leaders, startup founders, tech leaders, about their journey and how they've solved the problems that you can likely face in your own journey. If you scan the QR code, you are able to subscribe to it. One of the most important tools, as you can tell I'm a bit biased, I use that today, is storytelling. We can read a lot of books, we can take a lot of courses, get a lot of certs, which I'm not saying is wrong, that's beneficial, but I think the most important tangible things that resonate with us are how we learn from other people's stories. So feel free to scan that QR code and subscribe, and thank you for listening today. Oh, also, because a lot of you have seen me in the Discord, please, please, please join the Discord if you haven't and participate in our Discord to Departure Challenge. We have two free round trip tickets on anywhere that Ethiopian Airlines serves. I'm Tanzanian American, I'm a bit biased, but I promise if you win those two tickets, I'm more than happy to give you advice to Tanzania or Zanzibar specifically. Awesome. Ooh. Let's give it up for Nafisa. I felt like I was watching a TED Talk. Anybody else feel like I was watching a TED Talk just now? She was out here. Big Apple vibes. So clap, clap it up for yourselves. We made it to the end. How'd y'all enjoy day two? 
Was it good? Was it great? Did y'all enjoy it? True indeed. I got some housekeeping items, and then we are gonna finish up and let you guys go about the rest of your day. Um, tomorrow, we have office hours. So tomorrow for office hours, you should have gotten an email that will let you know what time your office hours are. Please check your schedule, please check the time, please be on time, because we got a lot of people to get to for the office hours. We also have our marketplace. So our marketplace is gonna be upstairs. It's gonna, you're gonna bring your money, bring your cash, bring your card, bring your Apple wallet, and spend at our marketplace, which is gonna be upstairs, right up here where the suites are. We're gonna have our sponsor expo. So our sponsor expo is going to be downstairs right to the right-hand side of the side of the stage. So if you wanna meet some of our sponsors, possibly shoot, shoot your shot and get a job, I think that's what a lot of us are here for, then please go over there and show love to our sponsors, shoot your shot if you want to. Now tonight, let's go support our own at Poetry Me Please at 6 p.m. I feel like this drone is going kind of crazy. But uh, Poetry Please is gonna be at 6 p.m. and that's gonna be at Focus. You could check the uh, Text Giving Summit website to go and definitely show love for that. It's gonna be poetry, it's gonna be happy hour, it's gonna be great vibes. So let's go all do something a little bit classy and enjoy ourselves. And if you try and get a little ratchet, later tonight is gonna be the R&B after party. So the R&B after party is gonna be at like 10, 11 o'clock, that's gonna be at Law Society. That's all I have for y'all. Thank you guys for showing up and showing love for us. Let's give it up one more time for DJ Yannick Jones. Let's give it one more time for the entire text giving team. And give it up one last time for yourselves. Y'all gonna be tired of me. I got y'all clapping all day, I'm sorry. But it's all out of love because I just want to continue to spread the love and good energy in, in the room. So you don't gotta go home, but you can't stay here. So you guys, we'll see y'all later tonight at 6 p.m. Have a good night. DJ Yana, take over. Again, y'all, we gotta we gotta start making our way to the exit. Unless you are here for what you know you're here for, uh, then you gotta start making your way to the exit. Unless you're here for Founder Spotlight, please start making your way to the exit. Unless you're here for what was already signed up for this private event we have going on, you gotta please start making your way towards the exit. We gotta clear out. We gotta prepare for tomorrow. Uh, so if you're gonna network, 
I hate to ask you to network in the cold, but make your way over to Cambria Hotel, do your network in there. Uh, we just cannot have you in here. So please start making your way out once again. Thank y'all so much. We're gonna see y'all tomorrow. Uh, or we'll see y'all later tonight, actually, at Poetry Me Please at Focus. We'll see y'all at Poetry Me Please at 6 p.m. at Focus. Or we'll see you 11 o'clock. You won't see me, but some of y'all go to R&B after party at Lost Society. Enjoy yourselves. Yana, you got it, bro.